Hello, my name is John Popwich, and joining me today at the 2014 Banff Mountain Film and Book Festival is accomplished writer and alpinist John Porter. Most recently, he's the author of the book One Day as a Tiger, Alex McIntyre and the Birth of Light and Fast Alpinism. It won not only the award for best book on mountaineering history, but the grand prize in this year's mountain book competition. So tell me why this book and why now? Um, <clears throat> well, I belong to a generation of British climbers who were very active back in the 70s and 80s. And actually, I described the period between 76 and 86 as a, a, a 10-year period of extreme adventure in the high mountains uh, by a group of individuals who became known as the generation that nearly climbed themselves into extinction. And uh, <clears throat> as the years and decades roll by, uh, I'd always hope somebody else is going to write this book um, because uh, there were a lot of very interesting characters climbing in that time, most notably Alex McIntyre, who was my uh, main climbing companion for most of that period. Um, and it just eventually, through lots of um, emails and telephone calls from various friends who were still around saying, you've got to write that book um, because nobody else is going to do it. And uh, eventually, in fact, I have to thank the Banff Center. I came on the, the uh, Wilderness Writing Program last year, and that really gave me the, the impetus and the kick I needed to, to, to get the job done. So tell me how you <clears throat> wanted to approach writing this story, because it's, it's not simple. Yeah, it's very difficult. It's a very um, complex book. It's on many layers. It involves uh, as great of a picture of Alex's life as I could possibly uh, paint. So his mother and family play a part, his girlfriends, uh, his um, uh, concierge, if you like, Maria Coffey, who's been here many times as well. Not many people realize that uh, she was Alex's landlady. And I wanted to capture all those stories and then kind of use the climbing, the big expeditions as the pillars, but all of the soft bits of life in between and the things that were going on and the interactions between people. Uh, I think I happened on the, the structure after the first chapter. And the first chapter is just setting the scene. We're in a completely disheveled state in Afghanistan before the Russians invaded. And uh, once I'd written that first chapter, which kind of captured the essence of adventure in those days, it just all seemed to fall into place. I can't say I'd at any point sat down and said, well, this chapter's got to follow that chapter, and I now need to introduce these new characters. It just, it just came together. What was it like writing in this book? You're kind of an observer and a participant in it. Do you know what I mean? There's, mm. there's, you're, you're a character, and Alex is a character, and others. It's, it's a little different than other biography that I've read. Yes, I. Uh, when I first set off to write the book, I thought, how am I going to write a biography of Alex when I'm so involved in the story as well? And I think uh, Dave Roberts uh, got it right. He says it's both a chronicle and a memoir. Mm. So it's a chronicle of Alex's life, but it is in part uh, a memoir. Uh, at one point early on, I tried to write all the expeditions in Alex's voice. So I was speaking as if I was Alex, because uh, I'd read a lot of his writing. He was an exceptionally good writer as well. And that just simply didn't work. And in fact, it was uh, Tony Whittam on the writing program who said, no, ditch that. You know, you've got to find the two voices, yourself and Alex, and, and just play them off against each other. And there is a third voice as well. There's, there's a commentator, because there's quite a lot of history. And I have to step back uh, again and talk about other people, other instances. They, obviously, everything that was going on in those years. Were there any traps that you <clears> wanted <throat> to avoid at all in, in writing like that? I suppose the main trap is uh, getting a little emotional um, because uh, Alex was killed on our expedition to Annapurna. And uh, particularly in Britain, uh, you're not supposed to show any emotion about these things. Uh, and I think I managed that. But I had to also be very honest and because the kind of denouement of the book mm. is a partial breakdown of our friendship. Uh, I'd, I had to tread very carefully uh, in, uh, in getting that together. So how do you maintain an honesty in this kind of work? Because you, 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 in a biography, one always has to uh, walk the line between you know, celebrating somebody's achievements but not you know, over-celebrating or not speculating or revealing too much scandal but still keep a pace and keep an honesty. What did, what did you do to kind of do that? Yeah, that's really interesting. That was actually that... If there was a pitfall, that was the main one I didn't want to fall into because there was so much of Alex's life which was a bit wild. And at the same time, he was such an exceptional climber. 
Um, I think I've told all the stories as honestly as I possibly could. Um, you know, there are a few things which, um, uh, a few sequences where I've actually uh, not put them in exact chronological order. They actually made more sense uh, to actually run one or two stories together, uh, just because that, that worked better in, uh, in, in a particular chapter. But uh, I suppose the main, the main driver to get it right was I was writing for, uh, initially, Alex's mum before mm -hmm. she died, uh, but also Alex's sister and, and his girlfriend. So uh, if I got it wrong, they were certainly going to tell me. So the, the title speaks of Alex, but also the, the light and fast Alpine style movement. Do you feel that it's a book as much about the times and those moments and that cast of characters as it is? Of Alex, because he was one player. <clears throat> well, that's, uh, I think, Alex had to be put into context. Um, as you'll know, in any really dynamic uh, group of people, there will be a lot of uh, peer pressure and there was an awful lot of competition going on. But I also think it was a time where we fed off each other. It wasn't open competition. There wasn't any commercialization in climbing of those days. So you didn't have to keep on the top of your particular grade for fear of losing your contract with one of the big sponsors. We did it for ourselves and we fed off each other. And we, when we came back from the big trips, we always got together somewhere with our friends and told the stories and said, hey, you know, there's another really big face just down, just around the corner there. and Somebody better go have a look at that. Right. How, how did you come then to meet Alex? What's the arc of your life that led to, to meeting him? And um, <laughs> were there features of that time that sort of led to those kinds of meetings as well? Um, it, it's you know, a bit of serendipity. Uh, I was born and brought up in the States. Uh, my father was English. My mother was Nova Scotian. And they met when my dad came over to train Canadian pilots at DeBert oh. in Nova Scotia. Uh, and I ended up being born in America because my dad then worked for General Electric as an aerospace engineer. Uh, come 1967, I spent the summer climbing when I should have been filling in my draft papers because I was at the University of Oregon. And I got back to... Um, uh, my home to discover I'd missed all the deadlines and I literally was going to have to show up for the army in two days' time. And I said, I'm not doing that. This is Vietnam. Uh, it's crazy war and uh, I'll have to go to jail. <clears throat> and my father said, mm, no, you shouldn't do that. Uh, you're still 20. You can claim British nationality through me, mm -hmm. which is what I did. So within within uh, 24 hours of getting home from a nice summer's climbing, I found myself buying a ticket and boarding a BOAC plane to London. And in London, I had one phone number of a, of a climber. There happened to be a, uh, uh, a meeting of the North London Mountaineering Club that night. I went along, uh, met a pile of other really good climbers, had a place to stay and a job at the British Museum within 48 hours of having left the, the UK. So the next thing I needed to do was get into university because I wanted to finish uh, my degree. And uh, I went and blagged my way into Leeds University. And it just happens that Alex arrived the next year. Uh, I didn't know at that time, but Alec, uh, Leeds University was a tremendous, uh, had a tremendous reputation as a place for climbers. And uh, there were a number of characters there that uh, attracted Alex for the reason that they were there, people like John Syrett and uh, Roger Baxter Jones. So it, Alex came along because he wanted to join this group of climbers and I got there just by chance and that's when we met. So at, at that time, the, when I was reading the book, there seems to be a considerable overlap between what was the, the changing of the guard, the, the old style large expeditions that <coughs> attracted a lot of press, particularly in Britain, but, but elsewhere around the world, the nationalistic expeditions and the light and fast movement. But some of those players that were famous for that were also hungry for the new light and fast movement. What was it like? Was there a tension between, between all the players, the young up and coming and the... It, you know, like everything else in life, it's down to the individuals. Right. Uh, there were some, uh, some prima donnas around, uh, but very few. Uh, Chris Bonington obviously was the central figure in uh, British mountaineering at that time. Not by any means the best climber. There were people like Joe Brown and Dougal Haston and uh, Don Willens who were all geniuses at the sport. But Chris was very important because he was still playing out that kind of end of the great game. Um, I see all those big national expeditions as part of that, trying to 
plant your flag in a little space of, of heaven, you know, which days was of empire. Kept, exactly, yeah. days of empire. And everybody was chasing down the 8,000 meter peaks by any means, many siege expeditions. And then 1970, there was a, a one step in the right direction that rather than follow the, the easiest lines, uh, people began to look at the really hard lines. And Bonington led a team of exceptional climbers to the south face of Annapurna and put up the first really major new uh, expedition line. It was sieged, but it was done in a remarkable way, and it was uh, a step in the new direction. And it was just a, that was just a few years before Alex and I began to climb in the Alps together and, uh, um, and learn our skills. You, you ask him about the tensions. Um, I'd have to say that there was quite a lot of tension, uh, a lot of resentment um, for Chris and others who were making money when I think what you call in Canada the dirtbag climbers, all they wanted to do was just go climbing. And they felt that anything that smacked of sponsorship or money or commercial gain in climbing was completely wrong. So Bonington was vilified uh, by, by most of the younger generation. Um, in the book, I talk about privateers and professionals. Mm -hmm. And Bonington's uh, line was always attracted to the professionals because he needed professional climbers. He needed a business plan to go on a big expedition to raise the funds. Sponsors weren't going to back a bunch of dirtbag climbers. Uh, so Chris would kind of whip them into shape and say, right, you're going to tow the line on this. You're going to sign a contract. We have to present a professional face to our sponsors, whether it was Barclays or Bank or the London Rubber Company. Uh, and... Uh, it, it, it's funny because a lot of people who thought they would never go on a Bonington expedition because they thought it was all wrong. If you were asked to go on a Bonington expedition, you you left it jumped chance. exactly. Yeah. 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 So let's maybe take a look at some of those times and some climbs in particular. The the first one I want to talk about is the uh, the north face of Bandaka in Afghanistan. Um, how did you come up with this idea, and and um, and how did you get Alex involved? And what kind I of trip did, we, was that? We were. <clears throat> the last thing we were professionals. All we wanted to do was climb, and we had to find ways to get to the big mountains. And that was our first big, big climb out there together. Uh, I'd been in Poland on an exchange the winter before and been there for nearly two months and had a fantastic time and met characters like Wojtek Kurtyka. But most importantly, I met Andrzej Zawada. And Zawada was a big wheeler and dealer. Uh, um, he had lots of friends in high places in the Communist Party. Of course, this, uh, this is during the Cold War. Uh, and any interaction between um, the East and West climbers in Poland was, I mean, we were shadowed. I would, they tried to recruit me for the Secret Service uh, with, a, as you can imagine, a blonde woman, but I, I won't go too far down that line. Um, but Zavada realized that uh, there was a real opportunity to get together with Western climbers for a particular reason, that if we brought dollars and pounds to Poland, we'd be able to convert them through the black market into 10 times the value of, of what you, they would be if you, if you uh, took them down to the bank. And uh, that's what we did. And Zavada was, he was a great internationalist himself, but he had the same problems Bonington did, in that uh, in Poland there were a number of amazingly good young climbers, and they were all chomping the bit. They didn't want the big expedition style. So uh, Zavada, like Bonington, was when he went on his big national trips, uh, he had a real struggle with, um, with some of the individuals. And to, and to get to your, your question, on, on the journey out to Afghanistan, which we bought our tickets for about the equivalent of $40, Canadian dollars, to, from Warsaw to Afghanistan, because we had traded these, um, Wojtek Kurtyka came into, the, um, into our compartment one day and said, uh, Alex, uh, would you like Bandaka? And Alex said, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Do you eat it hot or cold? And he said, no, 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 no. Bandaka is mountain. Here, look at these, these pictures. You will want a big sheet. <laughs> and we looked at these pictures, and it was very like the North Face of the Eiger. And, uh, and we said, that looks interesting. And uh, that was the beginning of the breakaway movement. So it, it kind of sounds like the privateer's dream, as it were, right? It's, it's the ultimate dirtbag trip. You're, you know, it, 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 must have been, it must have been absolutely incredible. And from what I've seen, the climb itself, is, is, has it been repeated? Has your route been repeated? No. And uh, we were, I mean, it was the, by far the most dangerous route any of us uh, had ever done. And Wojtek still considers it his most dangerous climb. Uh, once we were committed, once we got three days up it, there was no way down. 
Uh, the walk was so bad, there was, it would have been impossible to ab down. We just had to keep going. And uh, there was, I remember there was a moment uh, on the, the last bivouac, five days up, and Zavada said, you see the, uh, sorry, Boytek said, you see the Pamirs over there. A couple of Russians last year, they got to the top of a face and they couldn't get through the cornices and had to go all the way back down. So here we are, 8,000 feet up the face. I wonder, what do we see when we look up? This massive line of cornices. But um, Alex was a master of ice and, and uh, he, he found a way through that. Do you, do you think that your, um, your own international movement, kind of from the US to the UK, um, maybe played into kind of a, a lot of other people's appetite for kind of an erosion of those old Cold, <coughs> Cold War politics and, and the borders and kind of wanting to move across those borders and just find friends and, and do what you wanted? Were you kind of weary of all of those other things uh, in that climate? Y yes. I mean, you know, because my life had become one long adventure, having left my own country at the age of 20, I mean, it, and then finding job, getting luck everywhere I, I turned, uh, I thought, well, let's just keep pushing that luck and see how far we can go. There was another interesting thing happening at the time. There were some very good rock climbers, uh, names like Pete Livesey and Ron Fawcett, who were making a real impression of very, very good climbers. But there were kind of whispers of chipped holds and uh, long slings over overhangs, you know, and pre-inspections, which uh, for the likes of John Syrett, who was Alex's main mentor and mine also, was, for, you know, forbidden. Uh, it was always on site, ground up and clean. You know, we didn't have chalk in those days. You just, without inspection. We also had a rule that if, if you fell off really, the route didn't count. Of course, mm -hmm. nowadays, people do things time and time again. And they're much harder routes, I have to say. Uh, probably the hardest things John Syatt was putting up in those days would be 511C or so, uh, C or D. Um, so we, were, we wanted to stay pure in this. And people like Henry Barber came over from the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, once he met Syrett, he wanted to, you know, he realized he'd found a soulmate because he was very clean as well. And a lot of other Americans from my New England days came over and visited. Roger Martin uh, from New Hampshire uh, did the third solo ascent of 0.5 and 0 gullies in a day. And that was the inspiration for Alex to do it. So that international American um, uh, English link was made very early on. And within a few years after that, we were climbing with a lot of the young French guys. And of course, then shortly after that, uh, we made the connections with the Poles. So the, the second trip I want to talk about is the South Face of Changabang in 78. And that sounds kind of like a continuation of sort of some of the same, same group of, of, of people. Um, how did that come about? How did that dream? We got on so well on Bandaka, Wojtek, Kurtik, Alex and myself. We said, we're going to have to do this again. And our original objective was sort of uh, the Shining Wall of Gashabum 4. Mm. But uh, that had been booked that year. Uh, and uh, we cast around. We thought, well, Changabang, uh, reasonably accessible. There's a big south face to be done there. Um, we, you know, we fired off a few letters for missions for other peaks, but the one that came through first was Changabang. And, uh, and that's what we, we decided to do. We were joined by a, a, uh, another very good Polish climber called Christoph Zurich. And uh, that made a team of four. And it, it worked really well. So... There's kind of a marked shift with the third big climb that I sort of identified in the book, and that's the, the south face of Shishapangma. And mm -hmm. you weren't on that trip. You were otherwise otherwise occupied. But there's there's some moments in that where I start to see some of the, <coughs> what, I would, what I would call the, the darkness. There seems to be a bit of a um, utilitarian approach to, to partner selection or omission on, on Alex's behalf, and maybe a, a deeper ambition and a tension between, you know, ambition and relationships and, and, and so on. Is there a truth to that, do you think? Uh, there is, and I detected that uh, when Alex came back. Of course, it was a slow progression. You, you kind of missed out uh, Dolagiri and, and Makalu before then. When Alex and I went out uh, as the privateers in, in 1977, uh, we were amazed actually when we got back, we suddenly became TV stars in Poland. But of course, when we got back to the UK, there was nothing. Uh, and I don't know if that attracted Alex because, you know, he suddenly had people falling all over him and, 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 and uh, he was, uh, became famous in Poland. Um, and then more so after Changabang. Uh, and at about the same time, he got a job as a professional, as the national officer in the British Mountaineering Council. He replaced Peter Boardman, one of our very close friends, uh, on, in that job. And he'd suddenly realized 
well, maybe I don't need to be a, a, sli- a lawyer, which is what he was trained to be. Maybe I can make a career as a climber. And with his successes on, um, first on Dolagiri and then on Shishapangma, he had created a list. And he thought, okay, if I do uh, these six big faces on the 8,000 meter peaks, South Face of Annapurna being one of them, the year after he was going to the west face of, um, of K2, and he was also looking at a new route on Longa Parbat for the year after that. He was actually going to organize two trips in one year, actually. So he created a list, and he realized if I do that, once, I, once I've achieved that list, then I can go and make my own brand of equipment or whatever. But in becoming his own boss, as it were, in creating the list, he put himself under the same pressures that, say, Alex Lowe was on the... Uh, Mm-hmm. on the fatal Shisha Pangma trip when he was killed, where he, you know, he didn't particularly want to go, but he was signed up as a contract. Alex had self-contracted himself um, to become a professional climber, and he had his list, and he was going to stick to it. Do, do you think he was uh, maybe a man of contrasts and contradictions, or was he pretty? Was there a dedicated consistency to his, his approach in those things? I think he was still struggling with... Uh, he was only 28 when he died, mm-hmm. so he was very young. Um, I think he was still struggling with the definitions of uh, his, A, his own abilities and, and limits. And the, there was no consistency, actually, in, in the way he looked at things. And he would, as you say in the Shisha Pangma trip, he would ditch a friend, as Bonington did many times on his trips, if he felt that uh, it wasn't going to work out. And on that Shisha Pangma climb, um, he basically was extremely rude to the people that had financed the trip and told them you're not going anywhere near the mountain and uh, told them to go trekking while he and Doug and Roger Baxter Jones went and did the face, which is probably the right decision, but it was a different side of Alex. Uh, I think a few years before he would have been much more generous in including them in at least one of the major um, recce climbs. Yeah, it's, it's maybe less about the necessary outcome and more about the way in which it's, mm. it's approached. Um, of course, we we've got to talk about the south face of Annapurna, then, which uh, which is sort of the the a, a big part of the book. Um, and and you said uh, that that's sort of when it became clear that the apprentice, somebody that you'd known, you know, early on, was now very much a, a master. But there was a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde mm-hmm. kind of feel to that. So tell me maybe a bit more about about what you meant by that. Alex, when I got back from uh, Chishapang, we were driving up to go rock climbing. And uh, he told me, he announced to me that he was going to become this very famous, world-famous climber. And I kind of said, Alex, you know, are you sure you want to do that? And, and he said, yeah, of course, that's going to be my career. And he overtook a car on a blind bend and said, you see, I'm immortal now. And I thought, whoa, um, Alex, that was a stupid thing to do. And he says, yeah, but I just wanted to prove a point that, you know, if you take chances, you can usually get away with it. Uh, so that wasn't the best psychological uh, image in my head when I went out to, to Annapurna South Face with him. I was quite worried. Now, I was supposed to be going with Alan Rouse, who was another very good friend of ours, and we were going to climb, as we did on Changabang, as two teams of two. But Alan came back exhausted from a trip to uh, Karen Co and uh, dropped out at the last minute. So that left three of us. And uh, Rennie Galini, I'd, I knew not particularly well, extremely talented Swiss-Italian climber, He'd been on uh, Dolgiri with uh, with Alex, so he'd actually become a much closer friend because I hadn't climbed with Alex for two and a half years by this time, and they were a natural pairing. And it, it, it's threesome sometimes don't work, yeah. so they thought that they began to realize that uh, the best way to climb the mountain might be as a twosome rather than a threesome, because we only had a two man bivy tent. Um, if you take three people, you need just that bit of extra gas, that extra food. And Alex, by this time, had pared the equipment down to absolute nothing. You didn't take two ropes. You took one rope and a sheath to abseil with. And um, this is where he didn't think it through properly. This is where he wasn't being consistent. He overstepped the mark. Uh, to be extremely lightweight, he decided we'll take just two ice screws and two rock pegs on the south face of Annapurna. So there was an argument in my head, well, hold on, I need to go because we can have an extra full rope. We can have four ice screws and four ice bags. Um, 
Uh, but it was very tense, and uh, we had a couple of really heavy-duty acclimatation climbs, and uh, I made a mess on one of them. And I did things I've never done before, like spill a pot of food, you know, which is absolutely taboo on a big expedition. And uh, there were just tensions that began to, to grow. And uh, at the same time, I had a really bad feeling about Alex's state of mind, and that affected my state of mind, because he was still, you know, in my mind, his, my best friend. Um, and it um, just began... To, um, to fall apart. Speaking of which, the, the sort of sense of dread that you had, you write about that in a, in a few places where there's this idea of the, uh, the, the, the concept of, of, of fate or destiny, and then as that chapter kind of unfolds, it becomes a, a little, bit, little bit clearer. Um, tell me more about that, you know, how, how you felt uncertain, and you know, even the, the story about the car kind of mm -hmm. is a prequel to that. Right? Both Sarah Richard and I noticed a change in Alex. Sarah Richard was the love of Alex's life. They were incredibly close. And uh, they're, they're only together two and a half years, but Alex was struggling within himself um, to take love along. Our house famously said, the worst thing you can do as a climber is be in love with somebody because it completely messes up your climbing. And Alex was having to deal with that. But Sarah said after first Makalu, where he got hit on the head on a rock, he got depressed for the first time and he said, to her that, you know, I've, I've got a bad feeling at some time in my life I'm going to die um, in a stone, by a stonefall. And uh, Sarah said, come on, Alex, you know, um, you just have to be more careful. And he got really quite angry with her and said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried. You don't understand how I feel. I'm really quite scared. But he pulled himself together and he forgot all that and had those uh, two really good trips after that, Dolagiri and uh, Shichapangma. But... <sighs> In our final days before he went on the face on Annapurna, he was extremely nervous and he'd be waking up in the middle of the night and we both had strange feelings. You'd, you'd wake up thinking you'd heard a, a rock fall mm -hmm. and you'd listen, it'd be absolute silence and there'd just be that star-filled heaven outside and everything completely still and peaceful. But it happened to both, to both of us. And Jean in particular um, felt that, perhaps uh, Jean, his mother, felt that he'd had a... Premonition, because when we were going to fly out, he'd done something he never did before. He ran back to the car and put his head through the window and said, I love you, Mum. Just make sure you look after Libby and Sarah if anything happens to me. Um, whether it was a premonition or whether it was just the natural fear, but unfortunately, um, what happened could be described as, um, as fate. So as, as a mentor and a close friend of his, obviously, um, did you feel a tremendous load and a guilt and just a, from in those days that followed, uh, in the years that followed, and perhaps was doing this book maybe a bit of cathartic experience for you as well? There was certainly, uh, um, maybe that was sort of added that to why I write the book at the beginning. You know, I had to get it out of my system, for sure. And I actually felt completely drained. And the really pleasing thing to me about the book is that my my group of peers, my climbing friends, who said, get the book done. And both, uh, well, Jean McIntyre is dead now, but Libby, his sister, and, and Sarah, his girlfriend, at first said, well, get it done, but we'll never read it. But they've read it now, and they say, you've really captured Alex. It's a real tribute. It's a, it's a great thing that you've done it. Uh, so it's cathartic. You know, it would have been awful if they'd said, God, what an awful book. Uh, <laughs> you haven't done my brother justice, but... Um, the guilt side, yeah, it's there, but I mean, everybody who's climbed, who's been on an expedition where you lose a friend, uh, I don't think it's any different than any other, what any, any other climber brings back. If, if Alex were alive today, I mean, none of us will know this for sure of, of what he might think, but what, knowing him the way you did, what do you think he might, um, what do you think he might have gone on to do, and what do you think he might think of today's, you know, because you start in the book talking about Uli Steck's you know, amazing solo ascent of, of the south face of Annapurna. Well, how would he have viewed some of today? You know, this is almost back to that question about fate, because there was another side of Alex, which I found extraordinary. He made predictions. Uh, he was writing an article for Carrymore. He was their uh, technical expert. Uh, in the, He was their first technical expert uh, back in 1982. And he wrote the preface, uh, which was printed posthumously in the Kerrymore Technical Guide. And within that, he did exactly what you said. He predicted the coming of people like Uli Steck. And he basically put it in words like, somebody will come along in the not too distant future and climb the south face of Annapurna in a time that is beyond our comprehension. 
which it was in those days. We'd hold maybe three days on the face. Uh, Uli did it up and down in 28 hours. But the other things he predicted were the internet, times when people could speak to friends and put on blogs from base camp, a time when uh, climbers would be paid to go climbing. We were bivouacked on uh, a ridge on, a, on Hoon Chuli as part of our acclimatization. I looked, looked way out on, towards the Indian Plains and there was a few lights there. And I said, Alex, look at that. This must be hotels with generators down in Pokhara. And he says, you know what? When we come back here in 30 years time, there'll be lights right up this valley. Oh, come on, Alex, don't be silly, because why would anybody want to do that? These are subsistence farmers here. He said, no, you don't understand. Climbing is changing, mountaineering is changing. There are going to be thousands of people coming here in 30 years. And, of course, he was absolutely right. So the answer to your question is, I think probably the... Alex was a great innovator and a great designer, and he had a career. Um, there was a very sad moment in the book where he uh, took a really long fall on Changabang, and we were using something called a Haston sack, and uh, Dougal Hassan had been killed just the year before, and these were brilliant rock sacks for their day. And I got down to Alex, and he was really banged up and a bit shaken, and he said, I don't want to play this game to have a rock sack named after me. But, of course, the sad irony of that is a few years later, Kerry Ball had their Mac sack, mm -hmm. which was named after Alex posthumously. I think he would have been a designer. He would have had his own brand. He loved what was coming. Um, he wanted to see uh, a, a much uh, more open um, society in mountaineering, more people coming in, more people buying gear. He wanted to see equipment which really did keep you warm and, and safe, and I'm sure he would have designed a lot of stuff. But that was one of his paths. He could very easily become a barrister because he had an extremely good legal mind. Everybody comments on that. And one of his best friends, Terry Mooney, was a barrister, so he had that as another possible... Uh, role model. And the third area was possibly, he was an extremely um, good in, um, presenter. You know, he could charm the pants off of any, any radio or even TV announcer. So who knows? My guess is that he would have seen out the, his dreams. He would have seen his predictions come true by playing an active role and making sure they did come true. So maybe that's that's kind of his legacy in the end, if I think about it. And uh, do you think there's there's more to his legacy? And also, I'd, I'd include yourself and all your fellow privateers, kind of in that. What 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 would you sort of see as 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 the legacy of all those times? I think going back to your first question, why why write the book? Well, Alex's legacy is with us uh, in terms of a lot of uh, lightweight uh, equipment, a lot of. Um, modern things which kind of hark back to Alex's ideas, and, and that is the legacy. He was part of a, of a movement of change and a time of change which was or would have been invisible unless we had a record of that in writing. So, yeah, we're, some of us are kind of living legacy. And this, I had this interesting discussion um, last night with a girl who wasn't able to ask a question after my presentation. She said, at one point in the book you say that uh, Sarah said to you that uh, although she missed Alex terribly as the love of her life, the thing she missed most was wondering what he would have become, whether they'd stayed together or not, and that death was the end of dialogue. So the fact that you and I are sitting here now having a dialogue uh, means that it may be for that individual the end of dialogue, but as long as guys like us keep talking and girls take the stories forward in their adventures, uh, and there's events like the Banff Centre for that to happen, uh, the legacy is a living legacy. So what, uh, what adventures are next for you then, What's on the horizon? I, well, I would love to get back out and plot up some 6,000 meter peak in the Himalayas. I've had a few bad accidents. I've snapped my quadricep tendon twice, and I've been much slower getting fit again after the second time I did it, but I, I'm beginning to get there. So I'm going, to, I'm going to work hard and uh, go and climb a peak in the Himalayas. Um, but also, um, I think there's more stories to be told. And Pete Borman, Joe Tasker, Roger Baxter-Jones, Alan Rouse, John Syrett, all friends of mine who feature in the book, Alison Chadwick, uh, another very little-known uh, British woman climber, their story hasn't been told. So I need to find uh, a book or a series of books, probably a book, um, 
which will bring all of them together. Because although I didn't climb with any of them as much as I did Alex, I, I climbed with them all, knew them very well, and I'd like to tell the rest of, of that story of the generation that nearly climbed itself into extinction. Well, we look forward to it. So on behalf of myself personally, thanks very much for taking the time to chat with me. It's a real honour and on behalf of the Banff Centre too. Well, I've got to thank you, John, because you may remember you and I met last year about this time and you reminded me of an article that I'd written in, um, Ma- was it Mountain Gazette? No, it was Mountain Review. Mountain Review, yeah. and you quoted... Short-lived British Yeah, magazine. you you remembered a quote I'd used of a, of a mystic called Novalis who talked about how uh, a man's character and his fate can become one and the same thing, and that was perfect for Alex, and uh, I managed to get that in the book as well, so thank you. Thanks.